<sighs> oh, this ancient land, these streams of Inacus, the place from where King Agamemnon once set out with a thousand ships on his campaign and sailed away to the land of Troy. But then he was killed in his own house by the hand of Aegisthus, Thyestes' son, thanks to the treachery of his own wife, Clytemnestra. So he died, leaving behind Tantalus' ancient scepter. Aegisthus rules this country now. He was Tyndarus' daughter, the dead king's wife. As for those he left at home behind him, when he sailed to Troy, his son Orestes and his daughter Electra. Well now, Aegisthus was about to kill Orestes, but an old servant of his father's took him and handed him to Strophius to bring up in the land of Phocis. But Electra stayed on in her father's house. When she reached her young maturity, the suitors came. The foremost ones throughout the land of Greece seeking marriage. Aegisthus was afraid she bear a child to some important man who then might seek revenge for Agamemnon. So he would not give her to a bridegroom, but kept her in his home. Even this choice filled him with fear in case she might give birth to a noble child in secret. So he planned to kill her. But though she has a savage heart, her mother saved her from Aegisthus' hands. He gave Electra to me to be my wife. He gave her to a man who had no power. If some important fellow married her, he might have woken up the sleeping blood of Agamemnon. And then, at some point, justice would have come to seek Aegisthus. But I never had sex with the girl in bed. And Cypris knows I am right in this. And so Electra is still a virgin. I will be ashamed to take the daughter of a wealthy man and violate the girl when I'm not born her equal. Oh, pitch black night, nurse of golden stars, I walk through you towards the river stream, carrying this jug balanced on my head. This is not work I am compelled to do, but I will manifest to all the gods a justice insolence. And I will send into this great sky my sorrowing cries out to my father. You poor wretched girl. Why do you help me doing work like this, carrying out these shores? You're kind to me, and I consider you the equal of the gods in that. For now, when I'm in trouble, you don't demean me. So I should help you carry out the work and give you some relief to the extent my strength permits, without you asking me, so you can bear the load more easily. Well, if you think you should do it, then go. The spring is no great distance from the house. Once daylight comes, I'll drive the oxen out, go to the farmlands, and then sow the fields. Hello. And welcome to Reading Greek Tragedy Online. I'm Joel Christensen from Brandeis University, and I'm here with the Center for Lending Studies and Out of Chaos Theater to bring to you Euripides Electra. This week we have a great cast with us as usual. Carlos Bellato just read The Peasant, Evie Miller's back as Electra. We have Tim DeLapp as Orestes, Paula Mahoney as the messenger in Pylades, a chorus combo of Bettina Joy D, uh, Guzman and Lana Coley, David Rubin, Eunice Roberts back as Clytemnestra, um, and there'll be uh, our special guest, Robert Groves, with us here in a minute. Now, if the story you just heard from The Messenger sounds familiar, it should. We've already seen Electra before on this, in this small stage um, by Sophocles. Um, and Euripides' play revisits some of the basic myths of his own Orestes, which we had a few months back, and the same story that we'll see again in a few weeks um, with Aeschylus' libation bearers. Um, this is Euripides, so he does return, and this tale is far from the same as either playwright or his own treatment in a different version. In this version, Electra really is front and center, and she has a husband who doesn't touch her. She had a uh, gathering of suitors to ask for her, and she has a kind of agency over the action she may not enjoy elsewhere. 
So the play becomes famous for its engagement with Aeschylus and Homer and other versions of Orestes. And we get the sense that the Athenians are in some way like Zeus at the beginning of the Odyssey, always looking down on Orestes and Aegisthus and wondering what's going on. Um, watch for returns to the Odyssey with a famous scar. And we also get parallels for Sophocles' own version, which may have, returned, may have been performed later. Um, so this play takes us again and again, or to a place where we've been again and again, to this moment of decision where Orestes returns home to murder Aegisthus and maybe his mother. I'm really glad to have Rob Groves with me here today um, because it's gonna help me understand what's different about this version of the play, Rob, from other versions? What should we be looking for? So I think you know one of the things that's the most striking about this play right from the beginning is the setting. The, the house of Atreus in, in Aeschylus's version is this grand physical presence, right? The, the giant palace that we know of from the palace at Mycenae sort of evoked there. And now everything has been transferred to the peasant's shack. We are not in Mycenae, we're outside of town, we're in the countryside. And we've got this humble little shack. And I think this fundamentally changes everything, right? Electra, instead of being the princess in the palace, is now reduced basically to the level of a, a lower class farm worker's wife carrying water as her slaves once would have. And so this change is, is sort of fundamental uh, to the plot, but I think Euripides also uses this change to dig into different issues. For Aeschylus, this story is all about justice and, and the establishment of, of hierarchies in, in the universe. Uh, in this play, he's Aeschylus, or sorry, Euripides is not so interested in that. What he's really interested in thinking through is, is sort of goodness and badness and where we find good and bad people uh, becomes a sort of interesting thing and, and how that intersects with class uh, is something radically different than one of the ways that he's experimenting using the same plot, but in a completely different way. So, uh, and I love how, how you focus on sort of the different setting and the different sort of values he's ex experimenting with. One of the things that's striking at the beginning of this play, if you've just come from the Electra, is that Electra's married, right? And that earlier play, uh, she's got, she's accused of, let's say, strange over fondness for her father. And there's sort of flirtations with how she feels about her brother. Um, how much of a shock would it have been for an Athenian audience to have her married in this way to start? I think it's it's quite shocking, right? I mean, the character of Electra is this uh, sort of permanent daughter who never usually achieves that that level of, um, of of marriage, that transition to womanhood. And here again, we're going to see her sort of kind of stuck on the threshold of marriage, even though she's technically legally married. The marriage hasn't been consummated, and she's not crossing over. But I think for that Athenian audience, even though they know, yeah, someday she's going to get married. Um, we're not used to seeing her. Euripides is very much upsetting our expectations and giving us a, a completely different Electra right out of the gate than his predecessors had. And that's it's sort of what's neat with that messenger speech, which is a very common way to begin to play. But uh, Carlos did a great job of this sort of like, of this sort of tongue in cheek performance where you were presenting what everybody knows. And then this little bit that you might find shocking, which reminds me of say like a, a Greek textbook like Athanadze. Right. Um, if you're starting out this play um, with students, uh, what's one thing you tell them to look for in the scenes that unfold next? I, I would basically encourage them to read with Aeschylus in the back of their head, right? So to constantly be thinking about not just where does the story go, right? I mean, I think sometimes we can experience Greek tragedy just as a series of events that's all new to us. But I think more than maybe any other Greek tragedy, this is a play that you sort of have to read with one half of your brain in the present experiencing the events that Euripides gives us, and the other half engaging with the tradition of previous plays that, that he's uh, constantly wrestling with. I like the way you say you have to have Aeschylus in your head. I feel like you, we're going to get Aeschylus in there, Euripides himself, and Homer is going to be a bit crowded, right? Absolutely. And you're yes, all of those people are, are hugely important for this, uh, this play, so it's, okay. it's all up in there. And Euripides loves to play in a crowded room. Right. Certainly true. All right. Um, so we're going to have a, a longish scene next. Um, and in a little bit, we'll have a chance to talk again, Rob. Thanks again for being with us. Um, and we'll go right now to the arrival of the man we're all waiting for, um, Orestes um, and Pylades. Among all men, Pylades, 
I think of you as a loving host, foremost in my trust. I've come here from God's mysterious shrine to Argive lands to avenge the killing of my father by murdering the ones who butchered him. Last night, I visited my father's tomb where I wept and started sacrificing by cutting off a lock of hair. And then on the altar, I made an offering of blood from a sheep I slaughtered. I've come to these fields near the border for two reasons, which act on me as one. So I may run off to a different land if someone sees me and knows who I am and to find my sister who's living here. So they say, joined in marriage to a man, no virgin anymore. I could meet her, make her my accomplice in the murder and in this way get clear information about what's happening inside the walls. I can see a household servant. Her shaven head is carrying a water jug. Let, let's sit and ask this female slave some questions, Pylades, and see if we can get some word about the business which has brought us here. You must step quickly now. It's time to move, keep going, lamenting as you go. Alas, for me. Yes, for me. I am Agamemnon's child, born from Clytemnestra, Tyndareus's hateful daughter. Oh, my father, Agamemnon. You now live in Hades, murdered by Aegisthus and your wife. Come now, raise the same lament, seize the joy of prolonged weeping. You must step quickly now. It's time to move, keep going, lamenting as you go. Alas for me, yes for me. Well, my poor brother, in what town, to what household have you wandered? Abandoning your abject sister to such painful circumstance in her paternal home. Come to me in my unhappy wretchedness. Be my deliverer from pain, O oh, Zeus. Zeus, be an avenger for my father and the hateful shedding of his blood once you set your roaming foot in Argos. Oh, Electra, daughter of Agamemnon, I've come here to your royal dwelling place to tell you a milk-drinking man has come, one of those who walks the mountains. He's traveled from Mycenae and says the Argives have proclaimed a sacrifice two days from now and every young bride has to go to hear a shrine in the procession. My sad heart is beating fast, my friends, but not for festive ornaments or necklaces made out of gold. I won't stand with the Argive girls in choruses or beat my foot as I whirl in the dance. The goddess is great. So come, borrow thick woven clothes from me and put them on with gold as well, graceful ornaments to favor me. Do you think that with your tears, you can control your enemies if you have no respect for gods? The gods pay no attention to the cries of this ill-fated girl or to the murder of my father all that time ago. Alas, women, I must end my lamentation. Some strangers lurking behind the altar near the house are moving out of hiding. Let's be off. Run from these troublemakers. Stay here, poor girl. Don't fear my hand. Oh, Phoebus, Apollo, I entreat you, do not let me die. Leave now. Don't put your hands on those you should not touch. There's no one I have more right to touch. Then why wait behind my house in ambush with your sword drawn? Stay here and listen. Soon you'll be agreeing with me. I'll stand here. I'm yours anyway, since you're the stronger. I've come to bring you news about your brother. Dearest of friends, is he alive or dead? Alive. I'd like you to have the news first. My unhappy brother, in what country does he spend his wretched exile? He drifts around, not settling for a single city's customs. I'm here to see if you're alive and if you are what your life is like. Surely you can see, first of all, how my body's shriveled. So worn with pain, it makes me pity you. My hair cut off, shorn with a razor. Why live here so distant from the city? I'm married. It's a deadly state. I feel sorry for your brother. Did you marry someone from Mycenae? No one my father ever hoped to give me. Tell me. I'll listen and inform your brother. He's poor, but decent. And he respects me. Your husband's respect? What does that mean? Never once has he dared to fondle me in bed. 
Does he hold back from some religious scruple or does he think you're not worthy of him? No, he believes it's not right to insult my ancestors. Ah, yes. You've been talking of a noble man who must be treated well. If he came to Argos, what could Orestes do in all of this? You have to ask. What a shameful question. Isn't now a crucial time? If he comes, how should he kill his father's murderers? By daring what my father's enemies dared to do to him. And would you dare to help him kill your mother? Yes, I would. With the very same axe that killed our father. Ah, if only Orestes were close by and could hear this. Granger, if I saw him, I would not know him. That's not surprising. When he went away, you were so young. Only one of my friends would recognise him. The man they say saved him from being killed by stealing him away. Yes, an old man, my father's servant long ago. Your father, when he died, did he get a burial too? Once he'd been thrown out of the house, he found what he could find. Alas, those words of yours, awareness of pain, even of a stranger, gnaws away at men. But you must tell me. Once I have listened, I can tell your brother the unhappy story he has to hear. My heart's desires are the same as his. Out here, far from the city, I don't know the troubles there. Now I want to hear them. I will speak out, if that's acceptable, for it's appropriate to talk with friends about the burden of my situation and my father's. And I beg you, stranger, since you're the one who prompted me to speak, tell Orestes of our troubles, mine and his. First of all, there's the sort of clothes I wear, kept here in a stool, weighed down with filth. Then there's the kind of house I'm living in now I've been thrown out of my royal home. I have to work hard at the loom myself to make my clothes or else I'd have to go about wearing nothing at all. Just do without. Bringing water from the springs all by myself with no share in the ritual festivals. No place in the dance. Since I'm a virgin, I keep married women at a distance. And this splendid husband of my mother, so they say, when he's soaking wet with drink, jumps on the grave and starts throwing pebbles at the stone memorial to my father and dares to cry out words like this against us. Where's your son, Orestes? Is he present to act with honor to defend your tomb? Hold on. Who are these strangers I see by the door? And why have they come here? To a farmer's gate? What do they want from me? It's shameful for a woman to be standing with young men. My dear friend, don't suspect me. You'll hear what's going on. These strangers have come here from Orestes. They're messengers with news for me. What are they saying? Is the man still gazing at the sunlight? That's what they say, and I believe their news. What message from Orestes did they bring when they came here? He sent them out as spies to look into my troubles. Hmm, they are seeing some. And I suppose you are telling them the rest. There's very little they don't know about. Surely we should have opened up our doors long before this point. Go, come in the house. In exchange for your good news, you'll find all the hospitality my house affords. Even if I'm poor, I will not behave like someone with an ill-bred character. Well. Nothing is precise when it comes to how a man is valued. Men's natures are confusing. Before this, I've seen a man worth nothing, yet he had a noble father. I've known evil parents with outstanding children, seen famine in a rich man's mind and a great spirit in a poor man's body. So how can we sort out these things and judge correctly? By riches? That would be a wretched test. By those who have nothing? But poverty is a disease. Through need, it teaches men to act in evil ways. So should I turn to warfare? But when facing hostile spears, who can testify which men are virtuous? This man is not great among the Argives, nor puffed up by his family's reputation. He's one of the crowd, yet has proved himself an excellent man. 
So stop your foolishness, those of you who keep me wandering around full of misguided ways of measuring worth. Men like this one govern homes and cities well, while those with muscles and with vacant minds are mere decorations in the marketplace. In fights with spears, the strong arm holds its ground no better than the weak one does. Such things depend upon man's nature and his courage. I applaud how this man has received me in his home, although I would have preferred your brother might welcome me into his prosperous and successful house. But perhaps he'll come. So with that subtle moment of dramatic irony, uh, Orestes stretches out the moment of recognition just a little longer. At that point, Orestes and Pylades enter the house. They leave Electra and her husband outside and the married couple have a conversation about the state of the home and their ability to provide appropriate hospitality to these guests. Um, a poor man cannot entertain guests. They, they guess they fear. Um, so Electra sends her spouse to fetch um, someone who originally served Orestes' life to talk about him. Um, and he agrees and he departs. The chorus then sing the sea voyage to Troy, the glory of Achilles and all the fame Agamemnon took with him even as he was cut down. The chorus sings of revenge and promises um, that it will come, singing one day I will see your blood, death spurts pulsing from your throat, sliced through by a sword of iron, recalling perhaps Orestes murder fest um, in the play of his name. And then we move um, to the next scene, which brings us the old man, Electra, the chorus, um, and a silent Pylades once again. So where is she? Where is my young lady, my mistress, child of the man I once raised, King Agamemnon? And how steep this path is to where she lives for a decrepit old man going up this hill on foot. Oh, my daughter, now I can see you there before the house. I, I, I want to use some cloth or a piece of clothing to wipe my eyes. They are full of tears. Why are your eyes so soaking wet, old man? Am I reminding you of our troubles after all this time? Or are you grieving about Orestes in his wretched exile and about my father whom you once held in your arms and raised? That care of yours was no help to you or to your family. Uh, that's right. It didn't help us, but still, there's one thing I could not bear. So I went to his tomb, a detour on the road. I was alone, so I lay down and wept. I opened up the sack of wine I'm bringing for the guests, poured a libation and spread out there some myrtle sprigs around the monument. But then I saw an offering on the altar, a black fleeced sheep. Uh, there was blood as well, shed not long before, and some uh, sliced off curls, locks of yellow hair. Perhaps your brother has come back somehow in secret and as he came paid tribute to your father's grave you should examine the lock of hair set it against your own see if the color of the severed curls matches yours what you said old man does not make much sense and how can two locks of hair look alike when one comes from a well-bred man and grew in wrestling schools whereas the other one was shaped by woman's combing. Well then, uh, stand in the footprint, my child, and see if the impression there is the same size as your foot. How could a foot make any imprint on such stony ground? And even if it could, a brother's print would not match his sister's foot in size. Where are your guests? I'd like to see them and ask about your brother. 
here they are in a rush to get outside. Stranger, this man is the one who raised my father. What are you saying? Is this the man who stole away your brother? He's the one who rescued him, if he's still alive. Wait, why is he inspecting me as if checking some clear mark stamped on a piece of silver? Is he comparing me with someone else? Stranger, as I watch him, I'm surprised as well. My daughter, Electra, my lady, pray to the gods. What should I pray for? Something here or something far away? To get yourself a treasure which you love, something the god is making manifest. Watch this then. I'm summoning the gods. Is that what you mean, old man? Now, my child, look at this man, the one you love the most. I've been watching you a long time now to see if your mind is working as it should. I'm not thinking straight. If I see your brother... What are you talking about, old man? Making such an unexpected claim? I'm looking at Orestes, Agamemnon's son. Which mark do you see which will convince me? A scar along his eyebrow. He fell one day and drew blood. He was on his father's land, chasing down a fawn with you. You've appeared at last. I'm holding you beyond my hopes. After all this time, I'm embracing you. I never expected this. Are you really him? Yes, your sole ally. If in my net I can catch the prey I'm after, but I'm confident that if wrongful acts triumph over justice, then no longer should we put any of our faith in gods. You've come, ah, you've come, the day we've waited for all these years. You've shone out and lit a beacon for the city, the man who long ago went out in exile from his father's house to roam around in misery. Now a god, my friend, some god brings victory. Lift up your hands, lift up your words. Send prayers up to the gods for your success. Good fortune for your brother as he goes to the city. Well, I've had the loving joys of welcome. In time, I'll give them back to you again. You, old man, you've come at a good time. Tell me this, what should I do to repay my father's murderer and my mother, his partner in this sacrilegious marriage? Do I have any friends who will help in Argos or are they all gone just like my fortune? Who can I make my ally? Do we meet during daylight or at night? What pathway do I take to fight against my enemies? My child, when times are bad, one has no friends. It's a rare benefit to find someone who'll share with you the good times and the bad. But since, as your friends can see, you and the foundations of your house have been destroyed completely, you've left them no hope at all. So. Give me your attention. You should realize that all you really have to win back your father's home and city are your own two hands and some good fortune. What then should I do to succeed in this? Kill Thyestes' son and your own mother. And with that, we're just ready to start the kill everybody murder spree portion of the play. But before, we've got some amazing scenes to talk about um, that I'm really glad Robert is here. Robert, were you laughing hysterically at Electra saying what you said, old man, doesn't make much sense at all? Can, can you unpack the humor of that situation for people sure. watching? Sure. I, you know, I think this is a, it is a strangely funny moment, and I think it would have really hit for uh, Euripides' audience because not only was Aeschylus's play from 40 years earlier that's being referenced here, uh, one that was just broadly famous and one of the most well-loved and respected Greek tragedies, but also uh, it may have had a recent revival performance not long before this own play. And in that moment, the old man keeps repeatedly suggesting tokens of recognition, right? The hair and the footprints and, and later on in the part that we uh, sort of trimmed over the, 
the weaving that Electra made. And so um, all of these things that the old man is suggesting are in fact things that Aeschylus had uh, be the, the turning points for that recognition scene. And so the old man seems to be saying, let's do this as Aeschylus did it. Let's sort of revive that play from 40 years ago. And, and Electra both uh, sort of rejects this out of hand and basically just says, that's stupid, which seems to be a, a kind of meta uh, literary comment on Aeschylus, who is after all the big sort of granddaddy of tragedy, right? I mean, he's the big name. And so this is, is a bit cavalier for, for Euripides who never quite had Aeschylus' status to do this. Um, but uh, sort of in the end, Electra's wrong. Uh, in the end, all of these tokens were actually sort of indicating Orestes and, and the old man is sort of right. And so it's a very confused sort of scene that, uh, that plays with these things. And the one token that finally convinces Electra is a scar that, that Orestes has. Uh, and this seems to be a, an allusion to rather than a tragic model from Aeschylus to Homer and, and the Iliad where Odysseus is recognized by another old servant uh, by means of a scar, but whereas Odysseus had his from a sort of heroic encounter hunting wild boar, um, Euripides has his from a baby deer. And so if, if this makes uh, Odysseus the sort of grand epic uh, hero, we're left with an impression of, of Orestes maybe being recognized in the Homeric epic mold, but the result is that he's sort of this pitiable guy who, as we just saw at the end of that scene, doesn't even have a plan of his own, sort of has to ask the, the old man you know, what do I do? How do I do this? Where do I go? How do I get in? Um, who really has showed up in Argos with, with no plan cooked up, no allies ready, um, really nothing again but luck in his, in his two hands. And so this moment is, is both one where Euripides seems to be playfully engaging with that literary tradition, um, but also uh, sort of undermining his characters even as he does it. So Electra, for all of her quite logical points, right? That your hair might not actually match your brother's or that footprints may not stick around on stony ground. Um, she's just wrong. So Electra's not as smart as she thinks she is and Orestes is not as heroic as he should be. Yeah, and I mean, I think, I, you know, I could probably go on forever with the Odyssey engagement here. Right, because um, you have the scar, you have a tapestry, right? You have him coming home and doing all this strange stuff. Um, but the real the the real engagements are probably much broader and less specific, right? Um, so a couple things beyond the tokens, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about what Pylades is doing in this scene um, and why Euripides bothers to to even have him here? Sure. So, you know, if we know Aeschylus's libation bearers, which is the, the clearest ancestor to this play, um, in that play, right, Pylades comes with Orestes, and he's one of these uh, characters that Aeschylus likes using, where they stay silent on stage for a long time, and then suddenly they speak out, and our, um, the audience's reaction is, is sort of a, one of surprise and shock, because this character who's been silent for so long has, has finally spoken out, and when he does this in the libation bearers, it's to say, remember Apollo's words, right? And that's what finally gets Orestes to move to, to act against his mother, even though it's against his own instincts um, and, and sort of pushes him over the edge. In this play though, uh, Pylades is silent so far, and in fact is going to be silent all the way to the end of the play. So the, the two things we as an audience sort of expect out of a Pylades character is maybe this moment of, of finally saying something and in the sort of apologue in the afterlife of the play that he's going to marry Electra, but Electra is now already married. So I think Euripides is giving us quite a lot of suspense in having a Pylades who's here, who's reacting to things, and yet who's who's doing literally nothing and, and, and isn't going to take any action in the play. So, and I mean, it's fascinating because it's a typical Euripides toying with it. And then when you see what he does with Pylades in Iphigenia Tower, a Taurus, like is much more important, right? He's a chatterbox in that play. Um, but I guess this play is striking to me um, for how much Euripides talks about how virtue doesn't come from wealth and how class doesn't guarantee good behavior. And this is something Euripides hits multiple times in different plays. Um, but how do you view this theme in Orestes' big speech here? And this is, I'm going to get a bit dangerous with this question. Does it help us to date the play or understand its context at all? Sure. So, I mean, I, I think this is striking, right? As I, as I alluded to earlier, 
you know, the, if we think about the Orestia Aeschylus' treatment of this myth, right, that is all about justice with a capital J. And um, Euripides is, is less interested in that than in sort of engaging with the intersection of, of maybe justice or goodness or nobility and wealth or class. And this is, is as you say, something that Euripides is, is often interested in. But I think it may also be typical of, of the time period, right? If we, we don't know exactly what year this play came from and, and different scholars land in different places and I'm gonna sort of keep it somewhat agnostic on this question, but uh, we know that it's from roughly the 410s BCE, right? Somewhere between 420, 413, 411, something like this. We know what's happening in Athens at this point, which is one, Athens is um, engaging in the, the Peloponnesian War, right? It's, it's suffering uh, through this war. We have a sort of break at the beginning of the decade, but as, as the decade goes on, we get deeper and deeper into um, Athens' disastrous expedition to try to conquer Sicily. Um, we get more and more dysfunction until ultimately in 411, um, there's actually an aristocratic revolt that overthrows the democracy and that uh, sort of takes over. That, that revolt doesn't last very long as it happens, but uh, you know that uh, this idea of who should be in charge, who's going to be the best leader in tough times? Should it be the common man on the street, or should it be those born to wealth and power? And and Euripides seems to be weighing in here a little bit. He he specifically says right that Orestes says that this peasant, although he's poor, is the kind of guy who would govern homes and cities well. I mean, this is an explicitly democratic message and an anti-aristocratic message in this play. And so although we can't maybe pin this down to a specific year, I think there's something in the air that we're continuing to evaluate, is democracy actually a good form of government or not? Um, and one of the things we notice about this play is that sort of the higher up the social hierarchy we get, kind of the more morally problematic the characters are. The peasant and the old man are pure, wonderful, good human beings. And the higher up we go, the less true that is. Uh, I mean, Devin, the speech makes you wonder how an Athenian living under the various, you know, uh, changes of Alcibiades uh, would view government and life um, and just basically, the, the, you know, their status as sort of just under the will of these veritable gods. Um, so one thing, though, before we turn back to the play, I'm really um, struck in this play specifically of Euripides maybe sense for a life of a woman outside the aristocracy. And I can't tell in the depiction, I think Evie does a great job of making it uh, ambiguous of whether or not he's sort of mocking an aristocratic woman who has to work um, and what a Euripides sort of tonality is when it comes to a woman's life. This is, this is a great question, a great topic. And, and I have to say that I'm not firmly sort of of any opinion. I think you know, Electra certainly does weep and moan uh, a lot that she's no longer uh, sort of the woman that she once was, that she has to go out, um, that she has to bring in these, um, the, the water, that uh, she can't entertain guests like she should be able to, and, and so on. Um, but I also think this is tapping into something very real in terms of the Athenian women experience, which is that your status was very much correlated with that of your husband. And, and um, for somebody like Electra to have received such a downgrade is a, a major imposition um, and a major change in her life. And it is, I think, even sort of going off of Aristotle's definition, sort of tragic, right? This is a reversal of her fortunes that's happened before the play uh, has started and that maybe is getting better as, as time goes on. I think one of the interesting things Euripides does with this, though, is that some percentage of Electra's suffering is essentially the fact that she refuses to accept her new situation, right? She doesn't embrace her life as a peasant's wife. She goes to get the water, but she moans about it as she does. She um, is married to him, but she won't engage with him sexually, right? She's sort of trying to preserve her aristocratic virginal status while de facto she is uh, a peasant's wife. And, and so there's some tension there that I think sort of plays out her character a little bit. And in this uh, final question, uh, I'm wondering, do you think we, uh, I mean, Euripides is, al is always playing with myth and that beginning section where we're talking about all the suitors coming for Electra, should we hear echoes of Helen and Penelope? Are we playing with this type of competition? I think any play with the house of Atreus, any play with this family, Helen is always in the background, right? Because Helen of course is aunt and also 
the uncle's wife and also you know so there's there's all sorts of, of family connections there and certainly everybody coming for um the, sort of the the assembly of suitors um makes a lot of sense in in turning electra into a potential kind of helen figure and of course rather than actually marry her off to somebody which could set off a whole sort of alternate epic world um sort of the just this is plan of sticking her with a peasant just removes her from the world of epic. We can't deal with an epic character who's uh, a humble farm wife. Um, and so his solution, rather than sort of risk rolling the dice on this, is just to sort of remove her from that world. And of course, that's also the world of tragedy. That world of epic and tragedy sort of live in the same place for everybody but Euripides, who's quite happy to get down in the muck. And that variation on myth takes us from the world of myth to the world of every day, from the aristocrats to the world of the people. And so it's a really, it's a brilliant way to start the play and introduce these themes. Absolutely, right? And especially if Euripides is interested in thinking about the difference between aristocrats or uh, rulers and, and common people, right? Um, to bring the grand tragedy down into dirty farm life um, sort of plays into this. And what would happen if this same play has to happen but now we don't have the palace as a background. We don't have Orestes being able to walk up to the palace and knock on the door. Instead, he has to find a way to get to Clytemnestra and to Aegisthus while being out in the country and, and not having the resources of the palace and everything there. Yeah, that makes a very different story, right? Uh, tragedy reads differently if you're in a laundromat as opposed to if you're on the stage. Um, so we're going to move back to the play now, and while the, in the scenes we skip, Orestes, Electra, and the old man set to planning. As Rob says, Orestes is clueless, so he needs help, um, and the plan is the plan as you'd expect it. They're going to assassinate Aegisthus and Clytemnestra, and Aegisthus just happens to be conveniently making a sacrifice where Orestes plans to join him as a stranger, ambush him, and kill him. Electra proposes to lure Clytemnestra away with a false report of that she is giving birth to her son. So the trio pray for success. Electra asks the chorus uh, to signal her uh, while she waits in the house. And then Orestes and Pylades depart and the chorus sings of the conflict between Atreus and Thyestes, taking us way back to before the Trojan War. When suddenly they're interrupted by a shout from off stage. Electra appears from the house to ask the cause and a messenger enters explaining that Aegisthus has been slain. And he goes through the process of how Orestes came up and spoke to them um, and went into disguise and then ambushed him um, and spilled his blood. And it may, there may be some question about whether or not killing someone in the process of sacrifice is a completely kosher thing to do. Then Orestes and Pylades enter with the body of Aegisthus. Electra addresses, him with, addresses the body with a scathing list of his crimes, his faults, and how he's failed in life, um, and then orders it concealed as Orestes spots their mother approaching. Wait a moment. Here's something else we need to deal with. What? Those men I see, reinforcements coming from Mycenae. No. That's the mother who gave birth to me. How convenient. Right into our net. What are we going to do? Kill our mother? You're not overcome with pity now that you're seeing our mother in the flesh. Oh, how can I murder her? She bore me, she raised me. Just as she killed our father, Yours and mine. Oh, Phoebus Apollo, that prophecy of yours was foolish. Where Apollo is a fool, what men are wise? You instructed me to kill my mother, but killing her is wrong. On the other hand, if you are avenging your own father, how can you be harmed? I'll be prosecuted for slaughtering my mother. But if you refuse to defend your father, you're a guilty man. But my mother? If I kill her, how will I be punished? What will happen to you if you give up avenging your own father? Could it have been a demon in the likeness of a god who spoke to me? Sitting on the sacred tripod? I don't think so. I cannot believe that this prophecy was good. You must be a man. Don't give way to cowardice. I'll go in. I'm on the verge of a horrendous act. Something truly, truly dreadful. Greetings, lady, child of Tyndarius, queen of this country of the Argives. Mother, is it all right for me to take that blessed hand of yours, given that I live in this decrepit house just like a slave? 
Now I have been cast out of my paternal home. The slaves are here. Do not exert yourself on my behalf. Why not? After all, I'm a captive too and sent away from home. Like these women, I was taken when my house was seized and left without a father. Well, your father brought that about with plots against the ones he should have loved the most, his own family. But you should learn the facts of what's gone on and then despise it, if it's worth your hate. If not, why hate at all? Now Tyndarius gave me to your father, not intending that I or any children I might bear should die. But that man, when he left his home, convinced my daughter to accompany him by promising a marriage with Achilles and took her to the anchored fleet at Aulis. There he had Iphigenia stretched out and slit her pale white throat above the fire. If he'd killed one girl for the sake of many, to protect the city from being taken, or to help his house or save his family, I'd have pardoned him. But he killed my child because of Helen's lust, because the man who'd taken her as wife had no idea how to keep his treacherous mate controlled. For all of that, although I had been wronged, I'd not have grown enraged or killed my husband. But he came back to me with some mad girl possessed by gods and put her in his bed so he could have two brides in the same house. Women are foolish. I'll concede the point. But given that, when a husband goes astray, rejecting his domestic bed, his wife may well wish to follow his example and find another man to love. And then the blame makes us notorious. The men who caused it all are never criticized. If someone had carried Menelaus away from home in secret, should I then have killed Orestes to save Menelaus, my sister's husband? How would your father have put up with that? So, is it not right for him to die? He slaughtered my own child. There's justice in your words. But that justice is disgraceful. If she has any sense, a woman should give in way in everything to her husband. Bear in mind, mother, the last thing you said, offering me the chance to be frank with you. You'll hear me out, mother, and won't punish me. No, I won't do that. Not if I'm giving pleasure to your heart. Then I'll speak, starting with an opening comment. Oh, mother, I do wish you had more sense. Your beauty brings you praise that's well-deserved. The same is true for Helen. But you two were born twin sisters. Both very silly, both quite unworthy of your brother Custer. She was willing to be carried off and ruined, and you destroyed the finest man in Greece. Since people do not know you as I do, you used the excuse you killed your husband for your child. But before it was decided that your daughter was would to be sacrificed, no sooner had your husband left his home then you were fixing your fine locks of hair seated at your mirror. Of all, the women in, of all the women in Greece, I believe you are the only one who felt happy whenever Trojan fortunes were successful and who would frown whenever they got worse because it was your hope that Agamemnon would not get back from Troy. But nonetheless, you could have stayed a truly virtuous woman when your sister Helen did what she did, you had an opportunity to gain great glory for yourself since bad conduct sets a standard for our noble actions. But even if, as you now claim, our father killed your daughter, how have you been wronged by me and, you, and by my brother? Why is it 
once you'd killed your husband, that you did not give our father's home to us, but filled your bed with someone else's goods and for a price bought yourself a marriage. If justice says that murder pays for murder, your son Orestes and I must kill you to avenge our father. If your act was just, then this one must be too. My child, it was always in your nature to love your father. That's how things turn out. I forgive you. I don't get much delight, my child, from what I've done. But why are you so dirty and dressed in such filthy clothes? You've just been confined and given birth. Alas, my schemes have made me miserable. Well, it's too late now to moan about it. There's no remedy. My father's dead. But why don't you bring back your wandering son, who is still an exile? I'm too afraid. I worry about myself, not him. And he is angry, so people will say, about the murder of his father. Why let your husband be so cruel to me? That's how he is. You've a stubborn nature. Because I'm suffering, but I'll stop being angry. Then he'll no longer be so hard on you. He's got ideas of grandeur living there inside my home. You see, once again, you're kindling a brand new quarrel. Why have you asked me to come here, my child? You've heard, I think, that I have given birth. Please offer up a sacrifice for me. I don't know how to do that. On the 10th day, as is our custom with an infant child. That task belongs to the woman who delivered the child. I was by myself in labour. I gave birth to the child all on my own. Well, I'll go and make the gods a sacrifice for the full term of the child. When I'm done carrying out this favour for you, I'll leave. Off to the field where my husband's making an offering to the nymphs. And now, the basket is ready. The knife is keen. The one which killed the bull you'll lie beside when you're struck down. Evils are repaid. Winds of fortune for this house are veering round. Back then, my leader, my very own, fought slaughtered in his bath. Roof and stone walls of the house resounded, echoing his cries. You vicious woman, why kill me now? I've come to my dear land after ten harvest seasons. The flow of justice has reversed itself and brings to judgment for adultery the killer of her unhappy husband once he finally returned home to the towering Cyclopean walls. With her own hand, she murdered him. The sharpened edge of a keen ax gripped in her fists. Poor, sad husband. What evils overtook this wretched woman? She did it like a mountain lion prowling through a woodland meadow. By the gods, children, don't kill your mother! I moan too as her children strike her down. The god indeed dispenses justice whenever it may come. O oh, Earth and Zeus, who sees all mortal men, look on these abominable bloody acts and these two corpses lying on the ground, struck down by my hand, repayment for everything I've had to suffer. Too much cause to weep, my brother, and I have made this happen. In my desperation, my fiery rage burned on against my mother, the one who bore me, her daughter. Alas for fortune, your sad destiny. A mother who has given birth to pain beyond enduring. Alas, Phoebus, that justice you sang of had an obscure tone, but the pain you caused was clear enough. You've given me an exile's fate far from these Greek lands. What host, what man with reverence will look at me who killed my mother? Did you see that desperate woman, 
how she threw her robe aside and bared her breasts for slaughter. I understand. You had to go through torments hearing your mother's screams, the one who bore you. She stretched her hand toward my chin and cried, My son, I beg you. Poor lady. How could you dare to watch your murdered mother breathe her last before your eyes? I threw my cloak over my eyes, then sacrificed her with the sword. I shoved it in my mother's neck. I was encouraging you as well. My hand was on the sword. You have inflicted suffering of the most dreadful kind. Take this robe, hide our mother's limbs, close up her wounds. You gave birth to your own murderers. An end to the great troubles of this house. But there, above the roof beams of the house, something's coming. Spirits or gods from heaven. That path does not belong to mortal men. Why are they coming into human view? Son of Agamemnon, you must listen. The twin sons of Zeus are calling you. Castor and his brother, Polydesis. Your mother's brothers. She's got justice, but you have not acted justly. As for Phoebus Apollo, I'll say nothing. He is my master. Although his wise, the oracle you heard from him was not. Give Electra to Pylades as his wife to take back home. You must leave Argos. It's not right for you who killed your mother to set foot in the city. The Keres, those fearful, dog-faced goddesses of death, will hunt you everywhere, a wanderer in a mad fit. You must go to Athens and embrace Athena's sacred image. There's a place there, the hill of Ares, where gods first gathered to cast their votes on bloodshed. That hill is where decisions made by votes are most secure and sacred to the gods. Here, you must stand on trial for murder. The process will result in equal votes, so you'll be saved from death, for Apollo will take responsibility himself, since his shrine advised your mother's murder. You must establish an Arcadian city by Alpheus' streams near the sacred shrine of Lycan Apollo. In that city, we'll bear your name. Those are my instructions. Since Pylades now has found a virgin wife, let him go home and leave Achaean land with the man they call your brother-in-law to the land of Phocis. He must make him a very wealthy man. Once you've completed your appointed fate for doing the murder, you'll find happiness and be released from troubles. Oh, sons of Zeus, are we permitted to come near and speak to you? That is allowed. You are not defiled by the murder committed here. How is it that you two gods, brothers of this murdered woman, did not keep death's goddesses far from her home? Destiny and, and fate brought what must be, an Apollo's own wife of Terence. What Apollo and what prophecies ordained that I must be my mother's murderer? You work together and share a single fate. One ancestral course has cursed you both. After such a lengthy time, I've seen you, my sister, and immediately must lose your love, abandoning you as you abandon me. She has a home and husband, and will not suffer undue grief, except she leaves this Aragave state. What else brings one more pain than moving out beyond the limits of one's native land? Hold me, my dear brother, your breast against my breast. The curses of a slaughtered mother divide us from our father's home. Alas, alas, you have said things dreadful even for the gods to hear. I and those in heaven have pity for mortals who endure so much. Farewell, Pylades. Be happy. Go and get married to Electra. The marriage will be their concern. You live for Athens to escape these hounds. We two are off to the Sicilian Sea. We'll hurry there to rescue ships in need. As we pass through the flat expanse of air, we bring no help to those who have been defiled. 
we do protect the men whose ways of life reveres what's just and holy, releasing them from overbearing hardships. Let no one wish to act unjustly or get on board with men who break their oaths. It's as a god that I address these words to mortal men. So we end in yet another play of Euripides with the deus ex machina, here are the twins coming through um, to sort of wrap things up. Um, but we're left with a very different sense and tone from what we've seen elsewhere. So uh, Rob, when, when I read this play, uh, I can't help but think of our recent performances of Iphigenia and Tur among the Taurians and uh, the Orestes itself, which have sort of not happy endings, but happier. This one sort of has that pacing where you expect it to be chaotic at the end and then you do the deed and everything changes. So can you help me make some sense of what's of what we're going on through what we're going through emotionally in this play? I, I can try. I mean, I think this is one of Euripides' weirder uh, uses of these deus ex machina, right? Uh, you know, on the one hand, this play has, has sort of taken us, especially in a direction that is is not the standard direction for uh, an Orestes play, right? This um, this moment of regret that they have after killing her, and the chorus slowly sort of turning against them and saying actually killing your mother maybe was a kind of justice, but maybe not a good thing, um, means we're, we're heading into sort of strange territory. And um, I, I see it as, as almost, again, Euripides playfully and, um, and, and creatively sort of saying, I have to end this play somehow. We're already off track. And so the only way for me to get back to tradition, which is Orestes, uh, or sorry, Pylades marries uh, Electra, Orestes goes off and stands trial, Right, the only way to do that is just to say, cut, here's the ending that you all know and love, and I'm not going to really connect the two very closely. Right, the, the ending isn't necessarily very motivated by the events that have led to it, but rather Euripides has sort of let this sort of alternate reality play out for a little while, um, but in the end, the myth has to take back over. We, he has to connect it back into the, the other stories that we have, and so this, this deus ex machina does some, some sort of key things here. But for me, one of the most interesting is that Castor criticizes Apollo, right? I mean, Apollo is, is the, the golden boy of the gods. He is um, the guy who's kind of always right and, and often annoyingly so. Um, and for Castor to say, you know, Apollo said this, but he was wrong or he was unwise in telling you to do this um, is, I think, shocking. Um, and in as much as Apollo sort of stands for fate and tradition, um, this is Euripides, I think, at some level saying, this is how the story had to go, but it's a stupid story that shouldn't have gone this way. And I, I, I'm really open to sympathetic to that reading. And I wonder, how much does a play set us up to feel that way? So one, one character who's really, who really stands out is Clytemnestra, right? And this is easily the most sympathetic and convincing Clytemnestra. How much does her depiction set up that regret at the end that the characters uh, channel for us? I, I think it's, it's, a, it's hard to under uh, sort of sell or, or to oversell rather how different this is, right? In, in Aeschylus, Clytemnestra is, is basically a monster. She's transgressive in all sorts of ways. She's compared to a wild animal. She's a, a sort of woman with the heart of a man. Um, and, and every way that Aeschylus can sort of undermine her and make her really a thing to be feared. Whereas here, you know, she's not entirely, you know, sort of an angel. She certainly killed him, but she provides some pretty reasonable justification. She taps into some real pain. And she also uh, sort of is, is compassionate in her way to Electra, right? I mean, she does come in to help Electra with the, the post-birth sacrifices. She does uh, sort of step in and, and maybe in her deferral to her husband, we see again, Euripides touching on, on what life would have been like for many Athenian women, where you know, even if you're Clytemnestra, you can't actually control your husband when he's being an asshole to your daughter. Um, and so you know, this, this moment, I think, is, is really sort of uh, compelling. And I find Clytemnestra here, if not necessarily heroic, at least um, somebody whose side of the story is really worth listening to, and Electra's sort of devotion to the act to this act of revenge is, is a bit troubling. And 
You know, um, one of the uh, people watching on YouTube asked about sort of the flirting with having Electra be the murderer, but ending up having Orestes do it. How much of these small choices are these choices about the characterization or about returning to the scope of the myth and this, you know, this word heroic that you're using? Sure. I mean, I think for Electra to do this really would have taken her very far from the Electra that we know from other versions of this story, right? I mean, to make her the, the murderer full stop, um, perhaps to the Greek mindset, would have just crossed a line, right? She would have entered into Medea territory or something like this. Whereas um, having her, you know, her hands on the sword and she's guiding him is about as close as Euripides can bring her to the point of doing the deed without actually sort of crossing that line. And so she's definitely transgressive and aggressive, but she's not quite a monster uh, yet. So, I, uh, Rob, I know you have a lot of interest in the performance and stagecraft of these plays. Um, what are some of your reflections on seeing it in this context? And what are questions you'd like to ask the actors about their performance? So I guess, you know, sort of piggybacking on, on what we were just talking about, perhaps um, the actors could, could talk a little bit about sort of how, how they were shaping their performance in terms of, of even sort of the level of, of likability of these characters, right? I mean, I think that we come into this by expecting Orestes and Electra to be uh, people we sympathize with and expecting Clytemnestra to be somebody that we don't sympathize with. Um, and how the actors maybe interpret these things for themselves and also how they have tried to sort of shape our experience as audience members of, of meeting these characters for the second or third time as we are. Okay, well, so maybe we'll start then with Clytemnestra. Um, so Eunice, you've had, you've given us great performances of Clytemnestra multiple times now. Um, so before we even started today, you were talking about how sympathetic this Clytemnestra is. What are some of the signals to you in the language and, and the play that really bring that right to the fore? Um, I, I think she she seems to be much more logical and want, wanting a because it's just that sort of one scene really and wanting a progression and to give her case really really to give her case and she forgives Electra you know she actually says I forgive you and she also says you know if he'd only done that I would have forgiven him. And it's all the multiple things that he does. And so I think she comes across as very reasonable. Um, and, and it is just that fact of women are judged one way and men are judged another and nothing has changed. We have not moved on. Yeah, and, and that's a sad place to and start. I think from an audience's perspective, they would go right on Clytemnestra, right on. You and know? That's something I, I love about Euripides' Clytemnestra in general. So, you know, Nifid Janiya Aulis, she's, again, a strong character. Um, but Eunice, do you think that Clytemnestra knows she's going to die and that she's just surrendering at this point? Um, whether she knows she's going to die at that moment you know, um, I'm, I'm not sure, I wouldn't, I don't know at the moment if she, if she knows by going into the field, because she doesn't know he's been killed, but I think she senses and knows all the way along that that's the way it's going to, I, I will be killed for this because I will be judged as a woman. Right, and that and will happen. And, and that's, that's sort of a sense I get. So there's a real defiance and insistence in the character in Aeschylus, but not so much the sense of surrender and acceptance that I see in, in your version here. Um, so I think that's something really interesting to play with. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Evie, you've gotten to play with this character before um, and the, the mother-daughter dynamic in this play is always an amazing one. What were some different things you brought to this Electra and what were some of the thoughts in your mind? I think um, something that feels kind of immediately apparent, apparent is that, um, you know, in this kind of physical work that this Electra is doing, in this kind of, it's, she's found an occupation, it seems there's slightly less of the kind of totally free, you know, this, this utter freefall we find her in, um, in the other version. It feels like there's something about that activity, something about, you know, Arresti says to her, 
your only ally, but it kind of doesn't, or it didn't to me feel like that. It feels like there's a lot of kindness in her life. And even the uh, conversation she has with Clytemnestra feels much more reasoned. It feels like they're listening to each other. Um, and it felt to me like Electra was really giving her chances almost, ans asking her questions, really asking, but why did you do this? And when given quite a reasonable answer, it seems like the thing that she really can't get past is the relationship with Aegisthus. Um, on what Eunice said, I think it was it was fascinating to me hearing it all. Um, the fact that there are so many different ideas of virtue that are deconstructed and, um, you know, the riches and the class, all of that doesn't matter. But kind of virginity in women is still absolutely held up as this. There's no argument. There's no debate. That's still... It was really fascinating, yeah. Right. And, and that's, a, I mean, one of the things about the play that's constant that I really had in my mind from last week's um, uh, look at Aeschylus' suppliant women um, is the way that, the, that the, a woman's body becomes a central locus of meaning in the play. Right, and um, when they talk about how uh, Evie looks from working hard, right, how how she's fallen apart. Yeah, <laughs> the first thing you'll notice is my clothes. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what? I, I, I'm sorry, the, the the mother is saying, "Oh my God, you're so dirty. Like, why are you dressed that way?" Like, I've heard my mother say that to my sister, my mother-in-law say it to my wife. Like, how are you dressed this way? Right. So there is a there's a sad universal there, and it goes back to what I sort of asked earlier. Um, I mean, so in this, Euripides is always this danger of verging into comedy, or at least the comic, right? And you all pretty well resisted that today, right? Um, how hard was that? So Evie, I'll start with you on that. Did you, did you just not see it in the language? Did you not see the melodrama there? Oh, no. I mean, it's definitely there, isn't it? I think, and that's... And maybe that kind of plays into the earlier question about your character's kind of likability or... And perhaps you know, perhaps there's something in that, that, that bemoaning, you know, the sadness of your day-to-day -day life where you have to collect your own water. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Yes, I know. Um, um, now, uh, and the reason, I mean, that just made me think, you know, in textbooks, women gathering water at streams is a common motif, things you have people translate. And so to go from like, you know, the, the operatic realm of tragedy to the daily life of gathering water and, doing laundry. Uh, I mean, it's interesting, right? Um, but one of the things, and Robert, I'd like to bring you back in here that's really interesting in this play um, is that Electra um, tears into the dead Aegisthus and insults his body. And this really made me think um, of someone like Achilles. And so one of the questions, Rob, that you asked is to what extent are Evie and Orestes heroic? In their excess, are they heroic? You know, I think it, it's a tough call because the actions are so predetermined, right, from the Odyssey. So we have 300 years of people saying these actions are heroic. And then uh, Euripides comes along and Orestes slatters just this at a sacrifice using sacrificial instruments. And he doesn't just kill him, he splits his body in half. Likewise, you know, Electra sort of seduces her mother in with this trick playing on her maternal sympathy. Um, and the sword through the neck is, is the way to go, right? I mean, these are, are rather brutal. And even the chorus at one point says, right, like you've caused a lot of pain through these actions. And, and I think those, all these elements conspire to make this, you know, it, sort of, it's just with a capital J, but, but on an emotional level, it doesn't feel just at all. And Euripides wants us to sort of wallow in that space a little bit. Right, and, and that's where the staging especially in a modern audience, um, can really change the reception of the play, right? We missed a lot of the description of the violence um, because we focused on the exchanges, right? But you could imagine a cinematic version where the violence again um, is a montage in the scenes, right? A Tarotino-esque um, spilling of blood, right? And the signals of sacrificial victims are strong in this. It's an excess too that may speak to something like the Odyssey. Right, where the return and the revenge is motivated by the gods, but the audience can't be sure it's right. Absolutely, and I think one of the other pieces that's so crucial to me for uh, the experience of, of Greek tragedy, right, is the chorus, right, who are constantly sort of spatially between the audience and the actors and who uh, really are the first interpreters of the actions of the play before we as an audience get them. And so 
um, when the chorus reacts so strongly to the murder of Clytemnestra in particular, um, they seem to be signaling our reaction. And again, if we had a chorus of 15 instead of, of just the two wonderful actors we have here, right, we'd get even more of that shock and repulsion to this deed um, that I think can't help but evoke the same reaction in us. So I, I know Bettina has to leave a little early. So Bettina, Lana, I'd like you to be, talk a little bit about the chorus in this play and what you were thinking. Um, the comments on YouTube were very uh, laudatory. They liked your work. Um, and this chorus felt a little and more personal, right? Like these are women we know and, and they're talking to us about what's going on. Um, what were your thoughts um, in being the chorus of this play? First Bettina and then Lana. I, I loved how the chorus number two, that, that would be me, was offering, you know, a dress and, and uh, ornaments to Electra. Like they've, they're friends, like they're, there is a community there. And I, I love that and how uh, everyone reacts to, to the coming back of her brother the same way Orestes. You know, he, we, we are all in this together. Wow, I felt like bursting into song at that moment. But yes, you know, we're all in this together, and we, we want we want the celebration to happen. Um, so I really loved that. And so when 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 Electra was talking to Clytemnestra later, even though Clytemnestra was making sense, was making so much sense, we still are on Electra's side because I don't know. There there is still that feeling somehow of community with her rather than with the queen. But then once the queen was killed, we're all re repulsed and horrified. Like, wait, wait a moment, I didn't mean that. I, I really didn't think that was gonna happen. Um, so it's a very human chorus there, very normal reactions, I think. I, I would second that. And I think it's so interesting that the chorus shifts at the end where we're, we, we've had this bit where uh, we're talking about how justice has been served and then we're horrified and, and upset. And uh, I don't know, it's just it, that, that flip is such a surprising moment in a way. The thing that I'm always struck with about the chorus is often it feels like they're very intimate scenes or like the conversations between mothers and daughters or family and so on. And, and uh, I think, Bettina, what you're saying about it's taking place within a community that that really contextualizes the chorus for me to make more sense of why all, why this crowd of 15 people are kind of there watching everything. And and what I like about sort of the the complicity of the chorus in this one is that it is really like what happens in the community, right? You have the downtrodden trodden um, Electra, and everyone's pulling for her, and they want her to take her place back, and then she does, and then you realize what the consequences really are, right? And what were you rooting for? Like, what does it actually mean? So part of what ties this all together are some of the other characters. I, I want to go to uh, Tim first. Um, Tim, Orestes has depth in some places, but mostly not. Um, this Orestes seems to be one um, who's pretty flat in comparison to some of the other ones. Um, what did you see in the lines? Um, and really, what, what were you trying to uh, convey with your Orestes? Yeah, he, he's a very different character in this, um, in this Euripides version. I, I, I feel he's, he's surprisingly vulnerable and has a kind of huge amount of self-doubt and is is asking a lot of questions and sort of doesn't yeah he just doesn't have a lot of faith in himself and I mean I, I haven't kind of come to a conclusion really on on how I feel about about that other than I think dramatically speaking that does come across as as a slightly more dull character a slightly sort of a slightly wet fish of a character um, compared to this sort of battle kind of hardened Orestes and this, this kind of pumped up uh, arrogant Orestes that we've come to know through Aeschylus's version. So yeah, a little bit of a, a little bit of a damp squib, I think, um, <laughs> I felt. 
I felt tonight and I didn't quite know how to how to give give him any more oomph than that really well I don't know if he should right I don't know no. so what I thought in the play you know what we see all the time is Telemachus being compared to let's say the Aeschylean type of Orestes and this is a more Telemachean Orestes right the sort of like hapless boy who just happened to live right he even has a nice scar to, uh, mm. to show that right and he's just there and he doesn't know what to do and people yeah. tell him and he does it and it sucks at the end. Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, if anything you learn from Orestes in every version that being a hero isn't a great deal. No. I mean, I think maybe there, there's, there was more, there's, there's more comedy in, in the fact that he's so, he's in, he's constantly in two minds and he's kind of, he, he's sort of trying to be this, this hero warrior, this kind of, this, the killer of his, of his, you know, the, the, the seeker of revenge, and and actually, he he he's then he's then sort of overcome with nerves and self doubt and angst, and maybe maybe there's some humor to be found in that. That I next time, next time, <laughs> maybe it's humor, or maybe it's you know disengaging yeah. with the whole heroic idea. Um, David, uh, as the old man, um, I mean, there, there's endless potential for comic effect there and when rob was talking before i thought maybe so the people would have put a mask on this actor that made him look like aeschylus right to make it super meta um what was your approach to the old man uh it was a kind of fully rounded character within the piece but also kind of transcends the world beyond it is kind of very much uh, the voice of the author uh, given all that stuff you're saying about uh in referencing Esquiz's version. So yeah, um, very tempting to have a lot of fun with it. And I felt like I hammed it up a bit, um, but but it's a wink to the audience, isn't it? And, yeah. uh, and I enjoyed that. Yeah, and I mean, I, mean, I think it, it really pulled things together. Like it, it did that typical Euripidean thing of, of moving you on a bit of a tone coaster, uh, you know, and, and taking you out of your comfort zone. You don't know what's gonna happen. Right. Um, one of the things I really enjoyed about this performance that Rob and I were talking about is the double casting. Um, so Carlos, you got to play very different figures, right? The peasant at the beginning, the god at the end. Um, how did you, uh, but your tone and your diction were very different. Um, what was going on in your mind as you were performing these two characters? Well, um, it's funny because these two different kind of uh, characters are very different, but at the same time, they see something that other, other people don't. I mean, with the first one, he, the, he knows what happens and who kills who and when and why and stuff. And in the last scene, Castor and his brother, they also know everything, but they have different ranks of power. Oh, yeah. So it was very, it was, uh, very interesting for me to play the all-knowing people <laughs> from here to here. But uh, in the same level, they are the same, you know? Mm. That, yeah, that's really great. And I hadn't even thought about the types of knowledge they both present and different power um, structures. That's really clever. Uh, I'll go to Paul now. Paul, when you were casting, was that your plan? Or is this uh, serendipity? <laughs> um, it was, well, yeah, I, I sort of feel that there's this, there's a power imbalance at the beginning and at the end of the play, right? That actually you're sort of, the, here's the, the peasant kind of, Kind of sort of wondering how am i in this situation right sort of i'm suddenly at the center of this huge royal drama what on earth is going on and there's sort of a power imbalance within that relationship and then again at the end you have a power imbalance because a god can come down and say well this is how it's all going to go from now on um and i felt that i really wanted to have the same actor sort of topping and tailing the play in that way um and and re recalling us to those to that earlier power imbalance um, that we started with, and I thought Carlos did a, a really brilliant job with no, that. Really, um, really I said the challenge of playing, yeah, and I said him the challenge of playing the twins at the same time. So um, I think uh, I think he found a great solution for that as well. He did. Thank you, Carlos. Now, Paul, before we move to Emma to talk about some of the scene selections with you, um, so you were Pylades again, except this Pylades never gets to speak, right? He doesn't get his Kevin Smith moment. 
Instead, he's just there. Um, what do you make of that? And how does that, how, how did you approach the play or the character? Um, well, it gives you a lot of options <laughs> in a way, because you're sort of bound, you're bound by nothing within the text actually. And something actually that I was sort of thinking is that this is, this is kind of quite a, you know, quite a, um, a potentially ineffective Orestes that we meet, mm. but he's, but he has turned up, right? Something happens before the play that means that he has actually arrived. And I kind of, for me, I was sort of feeling, you know, that maybe it's Pylades, right? Maybe he's the guy who's going, come on, come on, we need to do this, we need to go. And he's almost sort of like sort of the sort of the bodyguard behind, kind of go, sort of the tough guy going, come on, we need to we need to get on with this. Let's and in a way, as Robert was saying before, I mean Pylades is that force of tradition, right? He ensures that everything will eventually come back in line with the way it's supposed to be. So one more question, Rob, before I ask Emma about the scene selections. Um, do you think the Athenian audience was sitting there waiting to see if Pylades would speak? Would this be a running gag? You know, I don't know if it would be a running gag, but I think some percentage of them would, right? I don't know whether that's that's 10% or 50%, but you know, Aeschylus' play was so important and, and Pylades' moment in that, right, sort of connects across the trilogy as this voice of Apollo uh, sort of reminding us of that traditional force. And, and as we see in other plays, right, I mean, Orestes and Pylades' friendship is such a, a, pivotal, a pivotal thing in, in a play that does talk about the importance of having friends who will stick with you through the good and the bad. You know, um, for Pylades to be there and, and to be taking on uh, this role, um, you know, so somebody standing in a mask but not speaking is, I think, a bit odd. And, and I think Euripides is, is in some level, right, encouraging us to pay attention to that character, who he could have, after all, just cut out of the play and never had him appear. But, but he brings him in because he's important for us to, to think about and to pay attention to in some way. Um, and so while I don't know, you know, I think we always need to sort of account for the fact that s some percentage of the audience knows Aeschylus and some percentage of the audience didn't because they missed the revival or they just, this is their first tragedy or whatever. Um, Euripides is always playing to both of those groups. Uh, yeah, and, and I, one of the things I really like about this context is that we get to have um, Pylades on the screen and to think about him and ma Paul making all of his wonderful faces. Um, before we uh, close up for Sorry, um, uh, Emma, before we close up for the day, I wanted to ask about some of the choices here. So we left out near the end some of the messenger scenes and descriptions of violence. Um, w was that just because it doesn't work so much on the screen or were you trying to pr preserve um, certain other aspects of the play? Uh, I believe losing the messenger was a bit of a last minute choice that was uh, more for the sake of time. Um, I, the original intent had been to keep the messenger speech in because I think it's a, a wonderful bit of, of insane violence and also matches with the tone of this play that is very much, in my mind, this play has always been like the wrong cast showed up. Like the cast of this play expected to do like Chekhov and they've showed up and it's this. Um, so it's like a bunch of much like, like naturalistic, slightly more even tone, not even tone, but slightly more human reactions to these insane circumstances. And the original kind of layout of the scene selections was to keep in as many of those moments where somebody proposes something completely insane and a character goes, what? No, what are you talking about? Um, to really kind of honor that, that dissonance and that disconnect. I, I really like that because that really echoes that sort of central scene um, where the old, where um, Electra says, you know, what you've said, old man, doesn't make much sense. Right? That was the that was the one line where I was like, this has to stay in. Right. I'm building the entire thing around this. I need this this Escalian burn to stay. Yeah. <laughs> but again, it's not just Escalus, right? I mean, that comment it's on myth, right? It's on the logic of revenge, and it's on the, like the terrible illogic of how people suffer when their leaders are absolutely insane, right? Um, which is really what happens in Athens and nowhere else but ancient Athens would such a thing happen. Um, Paul, before we close up, do you want to talk about the competition briefly? Just remind yeah, people. Yeah. yeah, good idea. Um, yes, yeah, so um, as some of you may know, we are running a competition that is open to anyone who's studying at high school or university in the US and Canada. 
um, and uh, you can go to the Out of Chaos website and that is listed in the description below this video here on YouTube. Um, the competition is called Playing Medea and you just have to um, pick a scene uh, and record it with your group. It can be on Zoom or in person if you're kind of being taught in person at the moment um, and send it to us by October the 23rd. There are cash prizes and of course um, undying honour for um, all of the victors. Um, and there will be a competition um, coming soon for the UK as well. We're just getting the final details ready for that. Thank you, Paul. So that's October 23rd for the due, dot, final due date. That's right. And we'll be having UK, US, Canada versions, and maybe some other things up our sleeves. Um, so next week, we're going to be joining uh, together again to read Aeschylus's Seven Against Thebes. If you're into sigils and shields and walls, that's the play for you. Also, Aeschylus, um, it's a great play. Uh, so 3 p.m. next week with Seven Against Thieves. I want to thank Paul, uh, Liz, our associate director, Lana, who jumped from production into performance this week, Emma for making the cut downs, and our producing team, Keith, Ellen, Janet, Sarah, John Coley, Coley for his amazing um, images, Ali for making the signs, Center for Linux Studies for making this possible, and everyone for joining in um, and reading this play with us. I'll see you next week. Stay safe and stay well.